We have Adam in the house. How are you, Adam? Good. How are you, Jake? Doing well. We got Mark Blackton. Mark's always a great addition to the group. Thank you for saying that. I, somehow I missed last week. <laughs> it just went away. We noticed your absence. It's not my intention. I apologize. But that that uh, bankruptcy starter kit you see in that picture behind me, that's where I'm going to be the next two weeks. So I will not be around. <laughs> well, that's fun. That's fun. Uh, you know, bankrupts or starter kit, the definition of a boat, right? That's it. Well, very good. Gas prices just keep going up. It'll be okay. We're going to wait just a couple more minutes. I have some people messaging me who are going to join. So how's everybody going, doing? I rework with Jake or what's the story here? Yeah, while we wait, why don't we do a few introductions? Mark, how do you know me? I know you two are the all five guys, Dave. And, and That's whatnot. right. And, uh, we're doing some the work. We're working on some of my clients together. And what I do is business valuations and transitions. Very cool. Very good. Adam, how do we know each other? Uh, through Aaron at Bennett Financials. Aaron at Bennett Financials, who offers CFO services and all things tax wizardry, right? Correct. Ryan, how do we know each other? Alfi. Alfi. And you're in Oklahoma, right? I am in Oklahoma. Right. And you work Sepulpa, with Dirk. Close to Tulsa. Mm -hmm. You work with Dirk, who's a CPA, become financial advisor, a recovering CPA, right? Yep. That's wonderful. It's best Very job cool. ever. Wonderful. Uh, Heaven, how do we know each other? We met in Dubai. That's right. And you're still in Dubai, right? Yeah, I'm still in Dubai. Very wow. good. I lived in the UAE for three years. Oh, yeah. really? In wow. Fujairah. Fujairah. That's far from where I am now. <laughs> it's about an hour and a half. It's not too bad. But I uh, I would come there every weekend to go to church and, and hang out with my friends. So it was fun. No, that's very nice. Yeah. Jax Jensen, how do we know each other? Well, I think I work for you. I haven't seen you for, I don't know, the last time, but I think I'm still working for you. Very good. Hmm. And uh, Simon, we have Deanna here, I believe. Uh, she's here oh, by yeah. your invitation. Deanna, where's your video? <laughs> it's off. <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually really sick right now. Um, oh, no. Yeah, so I'm not, I don't have my A game on. <laughs> all right, all right. You can just wait, wait, we always like to meet face to face, but don't let COVID come through Zoom and get me, okay? Deanna's <laughs> part of my team, the Kaufman Advisors team. Very good. Well, just as introductions, make sure, did it save recording when everybody jumped in? We're going to actually play, put this on a YouTube channel afterwards so that everybody can have access to what we talk about today. It's not every day that we have Simon Hayes as a co-host or as a co-speaker here with all of us. And so we're very fortunate to have an ex-military friend who speaks like six languages, part <laughs> German, um, world traveler, who also, uh, like almost as if he's a mechanic, he fixes a lot of people's tax problems, right? So he's, he's a phenomenal guy who uh, really comes down to, how would you say, the, the level of the business owner to help them understand what opportunities they might be missing out on and how they can perhaps fix or improve upon their situation. Today, I don't know who's more of a traveler now, you or me. <laughs> well, well, interestingly enough, sometimes our paths do cross. And so, uh, you know, I, I think that we both have some fun stories to share when, when we do meet up. But um, anyway, the, some of the topics of discussion today are going to be rather interesting. We're not going to go too much into detail into all of them. We would like to actually encourage a lot of you to ask questions based on what we present today. Based on your questions, we'll know which topics to dive deep into for the future. Um, some of those topics might be like a mega backdoor Roth. Have we ever heard of a backdoor Roth or a mega backdoor Roth? Um, there'll be other items as well. Uh, you could talk about trust and there's probably more types of trust than there are flavors of ice cream. And so we're not going to cover all of that today. So the topic and the point of discussion today is to lay out there before you, most of you are professionals or business owners, and to lay out before you some of the topics that other advisors, accountants, CPAs, attorneys, financial people, insurance people, whoever, a lot of times they avoid these topics. So we're going to talk about them because we want to get out in front of everybody and we really want the client not to be confused. We want to make sure that the clients always have all of the options at their fingertips that might be best for them regardless of how people are incentivized monetarily. That's that's kind of the fiduciary role that we are highly promoting at Alfi 
uh, Strategic Tax Solutions and at Kaufman Advisors. And that's what we want to kind of portray for everybody here today. Yeah, I think uh, when we started talking about this a couple of days ago, talking about what kind of topics to cover, you know, there's kind of like the uh, the more exotic strategies that we use from time to time. And those can really yield the bang, the big bucks as far as a uh, client tax savings. Um, but, you know, the other side, what we're going to cover today is like maybe kind of using some of the more vanilla strategies and retirement ideas, but then how do we make these, you know, look at it comprehensively and kind of bring everything to create more tax savings and, and helping people grow wealth and the things we work on together as far as helping clients really understand their whole picture and then having that tax-free income when they when they um, retire through the different Roth uh, IRAs and, and different other planning tools that we use as well. So kind of like using like some of the more basic tools, but using them in a more strategic and comprehensive way. So I thought that was a, a cool thing that we thought about doing and something I work on with clients when when we have those kind of quarterly meetings and helping them look at, you know, one, how to save money in their business, but also helping them accomplish their goals faster. Very good. Well, Simon, we have an agenda, but as all professionals, we might deviate from that agenda. We have a list of topics that we want to cover today. Do you mind throwing up on the screen that list real fast? And then we'll, we'll just ask anybody if they have any immediate questions. Yeah. So let me share my screen here. So as we kind of lured you guys in with the uh, topic of discussion is the million dollar Roth, right? But then wait, there's more. <laughs> We're going to be talking about the multi-million dollar retirement strategy, right? How do we get to these savings and growth a lot faster? So the main ideas we talked about covering oh, are- If I can just stop you right there and not yeah. to interrupt. I mean, well, I'm going to, but- um, the million dollar Roth, I mean, that sounds fancy, that sounds wonderful, but then, uh, Heaven, how old are you? I'm 26. 26 years old. When when uh, Heaven wants to retire, I mean, she probably wants to retire early, maybe at 50, um, a million dollars just won't go as far. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, so that's why it's like, yes... For those of us that are a little bit closer to the age of retirement, you know, a million dollars might be the mark. How do we get there? But for for those who are farther away from retirement, their goal might need to be the multi-million just to buy the same stuff that people buy today with a million because right. of inflation, because of increase of cost of goods sold, because of everything, everything right. you see today on TV. So anyway, I just wanted to touch on that because, I mean, we're not being far-fetched. We're not being outlandish. Like literally somebody today... Mark, in your position, it's not unreasonable. And I say that just because you have a few more gray hairs than I do, but I, I have a lot. I, I use a poor camera right now because I don't want you to see how many gray hairs I have. But, um, you know, it isn't unreasonable for you to have a million dollar off in the next few years. There's certain things you have to do to get there. And Simon's going to cover that. But I just wanted to bring that up as, an, as a clarification. So some of the things we work on and you work on as well, Jake, with you know, the firm you've been with in the past, as well as your new firm and Alpha is like, how do we help business owners, you know, have the proper structure to minimize taxes? How do we help them protect their assets, you know, looking at the, all the various legal entity options, and then helping clients make a plan to save, invest and grow their wealth, right? And so on our side, in our firm, when we talk about tax advisory, well, we're not just looking at one layer, we're not just looking at doing the tax return, we're looking at doing all these different areas of, um, you know, looking at the state tax savings, looking at different corporations, and different entities, um, and then helping clients present that idea of like, okay, here's what you owe beforehand. And here's what, what we're going to help you save and what you owe afterwards. Right. So things we'll talk about today and definitely people jump in with questions as, as you want to, uh, we're going to lightly cover some tax or estate planning. We'll look at some of trust configuration. I think Jake can speak to those uh, pretty well as also. The importance of really configuring your money and, and safeguarding how you organize your money in your bank accounts and looking at the million dollar Roth idea as well as kind of the secret retirement tool, the turbocharger, if you will, uh, the HSA, right? Yeah. So th these are topics, if you go back, these are topics that are just common. I say common because in the United States, a lot of people hear about, hey, I need a trust or I need a will. Or I need something, right? A lot of people, well, money configuration, that's, that's, that, that sounds a little complicated. Maybe they don't know exactly what that means. But what we're trying to do is touch on some common topics in a way that perhaps is a little bit unique. Because what we're trying to tell you is what your advisor is not telling you. 
currently in, in the sense that there's going to be some people out there that have asked questions that have gone unanswered. And our goal today is to try and answer those questions that other advisors have not answered. And uh, so we're going to touch on some of the common basic topics that every individual, blue collar, white collar, whoever you are, whatever color you put on, um, that everybody needs in America, so to speak. These are, these are not topics just for the rich. These are not topics just for the business owners. You may or may not have a business, but these are relevant to you. And so that, that's the reason for this very simple approach to some of these common topics that we're going to cover and explain some things that perhaps not everybody has heard. Of. Yeah, that's for, great. For social? Um, yeah, or my, let's wait, I'm going to see Somebody else presenting? Just do my passport. Okay. So we'll just go right ahead and talk about estate planning, wills versus trusts. Um, I'm not an attorney. I don't set these things up, but um, these are things people should have. You know, a will you can create yourself. You can go online. There are documents and templates to do that, right? The basic idea of a will is who gets what and it appoints who's the basically the party planner when you uh, pass away, you know, the person that kind of organizes everything and also talks about who's going to be the guardian of your children or even your pets. Some wills are getting into that, right? So that's becoming even more important. And so these are this is something you can set up yourself. Whereas a trust, you want to involve a, an attorney. And sometimes you want to, um, you know, this is not my area of expertise, but talk to an attorney. And um, what seems pretty common is a revocable, revocable living trust. And it helps protect your assets. And that way, this stuff doesn't go through probate. It doesn't go through the courts. And it really spells out when and how uh, your assets get divided among the various people, right? So really, these two things work together. Who gets what? And one and how. So there's a trustee involved and also helps you create privacy around your assets so that not everybody needs to know um, who's ultimately owning your real estate and all your various different types of investments. Your trust can be the owner of those things. Why is this important? I mean, I don't know. Can you think of an example where a client of yours has not done this work and it came back to bite them? I think tons of people don't do this because they don't, they're not aware that they should have this, right? And so I haven't had any clients specifically because I don't, I have a lot younger clients, but you know, you read stories all the time of, of stuff where, um, you know, somebody passes away and it's a, it's a problem of how all their assets should get divided. Yeah. You know, and I sometimes try to just make it super simple in just like two or three sentences. And I say, you know, a will is, a, is an expressed desire that gets interpre interpreted by the state, right? If I have a will, then I've at least written down on a napkin what I want to ha happen to my assets when I die. Right. And it's it's subject to the interpretation of our government, of whatever 50 state or, ter or the seven territories that you're from. You know, they, somebody else you don't know. And uh, essentially, you're just a number and a long line and a long list of people, and they decide what to do based on your express wishes on that napkin that you might have wrote on. Um, a trust is an actual legal document, not drafted by you. It has your wishes and your desires in it, but it's in it, written and authored by an attorney in a legal way to where you actually designate somebody that you know to make that decision on your behalf. So you designate an executor or a trustee, somebody who will have your will, and they it's based on their interpretation rather than the, 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 the state of whatever you live in. Um, it's interesting. I, I'm just going to try it and, and explain the importance of this without really talking about all the horror stories. Um, it is so important that at Alfi, we have now decided that clients that come to us, and they might come to us because they're selling a multi-million dollar business. If they don't have an estate plan in place, we don't help them. We're not going to help them with that really big transaction where we actually make lots of money until they do this. Because what if they die in the middle of this transaction? Then there's no instructions on how to proceed for it. it like it is so critical and so important to us as an, a strategic advisory firm that people have the basic stuff, the, the will, the healthcare directive, the power of attorney, and like a family trust put together that we will sacrifice loads of money for other services that we could be doing for them because we don't want to take on that risk of things blowing up because some of the simple basic things aren't done well. In fact, like this will be very surprising to you. I have a $6 million business in Utah that's transitioning in ownership. It's selling and the owners don't have this in place. And they think I'm a jerk for making <laughs> them wait a few extra days to get this stuff done and taken care of. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I mean, their wives or their kids or their, their, 
heirs, maybe they don't even know, but they're going to be thanking me that this is all taken care of at least. And then we yeah. can proceed with the big stuff. Yeah. Anyway, I, I just Good wanted point. to get on my little podium and do a little estate planning, you know, speech there for a minute, because literally at the end of the day, there are so many really good plans that fail, not because of the sophisticated stuff, but because of the basic underlying things that we take for granted that everybody has done that they usually don't have done. And even when they do have this taken care of, Simon, one of the most common errors that I find when people do pass away and they maybe did some preparation, but they didn't have everything done is that they did not change or correct who their beneficiary should be. Yeah. And we're talking about people that have like second or third marriages, whatever, and they still have the first wife listed as the beneficiary of everything. Uh, and, you know, I mean, that may be the plan, but it should be documented and it should be reviewed if your life is changing dramatically every two years. If it's not yeah. changing a whole lot, at least every five years, because laws change. And your states, the state law and the federal law change. And you need to have somebody that like for a hundred bucks or whatever, will just put a, a pair of legal eyes on what you have as far as legal documents, make sure that things are done right. Yeah, I, I get a little passionate about this. So if I need to tone down, just tell me, tell me to stop drinking my energy. Okay? <laughs> hey, so and Jake, you like four tonight. of those are ready today? Yeah, this, this is number three. <laughs> number three. Yeah. Anyway, Jake, Brennan, Simon, yes, question. question for it. Yeah, one, I didn't know how passionate Jake was about estate planning. I about teared up over here with all that passion. <laughs> um, oh question for you, though, outside of cost, complexity to set it up, is there any reason not to do a living trust and just do a will? Obviously, yes. there, there's a cost time. benefit. There's a cost benefit. A lot of attorneys charge between three, five hundred. Sorry, between three thousand and five thousand dollars, sometimes as much as ten to fifteen thousand dollars depending on the type of trust, if it's a simple trust, if it's a complex trust, right? Um, yep. At Alify, we have a $2,500 package because we're not trying to make money off of this with our legal team. We're, we're, we're just trying to get people to do it, right? And we're, we're more than willing to make money off of other stuff. And so we just want people to get it done. And even if they have it done, we still charge them $2,500 to review it so that we can check the box and say that we've seen it and we know it's done. Yeah, perfect. I think that's great. That's a great add-on service that you guys have. Yeah. And, and I'm not trying to sell anything right now by saying that. Like, we just want to make sure people have it done. And if we're going to be your advisors and other stuff, you have to show us. You can't just say that it's done. You, you have to actually show us. And we're going to put our legal eyes on it. We're going to say, yes, this looks good. We can move forward with other things that are perhaps a little more exciting. Yeah, exactly. Cool. So speaking of trusts, you know, once you have this set up, um, there's kind of three parts to this. So three parts to your life here, right? You've got your basic, your personal tax return. You know, this is where your trust is sitting on top of that. You've got your operations, your full-time job or your side business or your full-time business, right? So this is your active income over here on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side, you've got your investments, your passive income. That's going to be all your real estate and everything else, kind of your base of investments that most people have in their home, a brokerage account, life insurance, right? You may have rental properties that are owned by an LLC. You may have a Roth IRA, one of the things we're going to talk about today. And then on your operations side, your active income side, you have your S corporation or LLC or C corporation, whatever that is over here. And that's kind of your, like, your trifecta, if you will, of, of your life. Of what's going on here? Wait, so wait, that, wait, 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 wait! That was a big word. What, what the heck is a trifecta? The trifecta, three. I don't know what the actual definition of trifecta is, but combination. All right, of, we're we're gonna call on the audience. We're yeah. gonna see who's here and who's listening. Let's see here. I need hey, Elizabeth. Elizabeth, are you here with us? Let's move on. Let's call on Trent. Trent Lee, are you there? Yes, I am here. Hey, will you do us a favor? Are you near a computer? I am Google trifecta while Simon goes on. And let us know what, what the what the Wikipedia, Investopedia, or whatever the definition of trifecta is. I hope it's a good definition. It is a bet, <laughs> a bet in which the person betting forecasts the first three finishers in the race in the correct order. Okay. And so then we, are threesome. If, if we're a horse triad, betting, trinity. if we're horse betting, we're betting on the order that they come in. The or top a, three. Yeah, it's a it's a run of three wins or grand events. Andrea. Okay, okay. So how does that apply here, Simon? 
Well, these are the top three areas of your life. If you're talking about your financial life. Gotcha. So you got operations or active, like I got a W-2 or a job or a business or something, estate planning, and then investments, right? That's right. That, that's the trifecta. And, and I, you can see that I'm a little bit dramatic, but this is important for people to illustrate and understand. It's not all about my job. Right. It's not all about my investments. Like this is a trifecta. Well, also the cool thing is like, you know, you don't have, you know, there's obviously we work predominantly with business owners, but people that have a job can also create a side business and take advantage of some of these strategies that are available to business owners and maximize their retirement savings, not just through their job, but also through a little side hustle, a little 1099 business that they have, right? And so when we talk about that estate planning, you know, you can have, um, you want to have these documents in place. You want to have the trust. You can have the potentially the trust, um, you know, be the owner of your LLC, right? So that creates a, a privacy shield as well. And so that's way, that way you can create that privacy on your, on, on your investment side, whereas your operation side, you might want to have more public because you're trying to actually get clients on that side, right? And so when we talk about organizing your life, and you know, we'll talk about having the ability to have an LLC in your Roth IRA today, and having that LLC own rental property, that's a possibility. When you're organizing your life and organizing your money, well, you need to have bank accounts for each of these, right? Um, you know, I think we've seen people that um, try to just put everything through the business checking account. And at the end of the year, it's a mess to try to do their bookkeeping. And so you want to have that separation of your personal and your business and have just business expenses through the business, right? You want to have you know, your, your cell phone bill that you use for the business, go through the business account, right? Whereas on the rental property side, that's where you can expense out um, you know, those improvements that you make to the rental properties or trips that you go to um, inspect the rental properties, right? Or even those research trips that you take to look at new markets and new areas, right? So you can, if you properly properly separate things out, there's a whole world of, of additional deductions that you can take there. Any comments on that, Jake? You know, I, I kind of want people to think that, you know, some, some individuals looking at this right now may not think that it's for them because they might say, hey, I'm a police officer. I have my full-time job. I don't own the business. I have a W-2. How does any of this stuff on the right really apply to me? But literally this is, this is for anybody because yeah. this, this police officer with their full-time job making 30 to 50,000, 80,000, whatever they make, right? Whatever their salary is, their benefits, et cetera. Well, the cool many- story that you told me the other day about your own family <laughs> was how you guys grew up very kind of an average income, but then you guys had this whole side hustle where you guys were repairing cars. You guys would buy a, a, a car and then fix it up and sell it, right? So that's a, that's by IRS definition, that's a business. And so just anybody having that kind of a hobby business, well, that's something that can create more deductions or more opportunities to build wealth, right? That is correct. And just to kind of go into the story a little bit more, my dad was a school teacher, right? Um, while being a school teacher, we had a garage in the backyard where we'd buy broken down, non-working cars, four-wheelers, motorcycles. We'd fix them up. Uh, we learned how to work hard, right? Um, I was really good at taking these apart. Not always really good at putting them together, but hey, you got to learn somewhere, right? And uh, absolutely, that was a side hustle. And I was just going to say, how many, how many police officers out there don't try to add a little extra income with some kind of side hustle? School teachers, custodians, gym, you know, just everybody, right? So literally, we have our full-time job on one side, and then we have like the hobby that we might make a little bit of money or the side hustle, right? Um, what do we do with that money? And where do we invest? Maybe we are a policeman and we go buy a rental property. Or maybe we're a policeman, but we also help with that bell bonds business. 
I mean, there's all these different things that can and, and have been done by a lot of people. People are doing them every day, but right. they don't organize their financial life like this. Right. And so looking at it like this and some of the next slides that you're about to show, Simon, help people understand how they're... Yeah, I mean, so this is how we help clients through accounting, proper accounting and bookkeeping and having separate bank accounts and separate credit cards and so forth. But also just all these things protect your assets in a different way, right? You want to have your business operations and your business checking account be protected and be separate from your rental property checking account, your rental property money. And each of these types of businesses have different types of deductions that you can create more of a tax-free lifestyle. And um, you know, if somebody slips and falls on the rental property, you don't want them to attack your active income, your 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 business income, or if somebody has a some sort of an issue on your on your side hustle or your main operations business, you don't want them to affect your assets on your rental property side or anything else that you're doing, right? And so that's stuff I work with clients on looking at their goals, what else they want to be doing, right? If they're um, starting to make more money, we help them pay less taxes. That keeps more cash in their business. And then with that cash, they can go out and accomplish their other goals, whether that's buying more real estate or other businesses. And then also talking to them about you know, their projections of cash flow, making sure they have these types of emergency accounts, right? They have these fallback accounts that are three to six months of life savings. You know, anything happens. You know, we all saw how COVID affected people. Yeah, luckily we had a lot of government money come through, right? But there are a lot of businesses that got really surprised and didn't have that fallback cash. And that's where that three to six months of personal fallback cash, as well as three to six months of business fallback cash can be so important. Let me ask a question. <clears throat> Jax, where are you, Jax? I'm here trying to get my mute turned off. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, very good. So tell me, Jax, this is going to be a very personal question. Do you fold your clothes? <laughs> oh, dang it. Uh, most of the time, I do <laughs> not. <laughs> who, who folds your clothes? Uh, my lovely, wonderful wife does most of them. All right, all right. How appreciative of your of your wife who folds your clothes? Very. Okay. Why is it important that she folds your clothes and puts them away in a nice, organized place? Like, does she throw your dress shirts in with your underwear? No, she doesn't. She tell tell me how things are organized. What goes where? Um, I've got Levi's that are folded on a shelf in the closet. Shirts are hung up. Socks and underwear in a drawer. Okay. What 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 other drawers do you have stuff? Um, I don't know. Do I have other stuff? I've got like tools and where, where do you put your boots? You got a lot of pair of boots. I know you, you're, you're a cowboy. Yeah. Well, my, my dress boots go in the closet. My work boots go by the front door. My mud boots go in my truck. Very good. Every place, every item, every article has a place and there's order, right? Yep. What we're suggesting is that what people do in their normal, ordinary, everyday lives, they like to organize where their clothes go. And they have to do that like every week because we get things dirty. We have to wear again. We have to wash it. We have to fold it. We have to hang it. Right. Um, and then you, you don't put your underwear, you don't put your socks, let alone your dirty socks with your dress shirts. Right. Um, th this is what we're talking about with people's banking. And different you know, drawers for your money. Different drawers for different money. Different drawers for different money and different entities for different purposes. I mean, why not just buy that piece of real estate in your name? Well, we should buy it in the name of the LLC to limit your liability against a slip and fall casualty claim and somebody attacking your retirement account if it was in your own personal name, right? And instead of just putting money into just anything, we should put it into qualified retirement accounts. We should put it into some of these other areas so that legally we're protecting assets um, and that we have a separation. So that the dirty underwear doesn't go in with the clean shirts and everything else, right? And uh, essentially, this is what I Simon is alluding to, that there should be some order amongst the chaos of people's finances. Right. Anyway, yeah. I appreciate you for participating, Jax. I, I knew that you'd be a willing no participant. And uh, I mean, I, I do pay you. So uh, <laughs> you, you, you do have to answer at least something. Anyway, as long as long as I can add value somewhere, Jake. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Jax. Jax is a recovering engineer who now 
finds waste in people's financial lives and helps clean it up. He does a great job. So let's, let's not underplay the value that Jax has. Um, but Simon, let's, let's move on. We're running out of time. Yeah, great. So getting to the, to the heart of this, the million dollar Roth IRA and how to, cre- how to create more of a tax-free retirement. Right. So let's talk about some of these differences here. We've got standard IRAs. We've got the Roth IRA. Obviously, with the Roth, uh, the standard IRA, we take the deduction now. We do have tax free or tax deferred growth within the account, and it's taxable later. Somewhere along the line, you pay the tax. So you take the deduction now. It grows tax free, but it's taxable later when you take it out. With IRAs, you are required by the government to take a, a minimum distribution, right? Because it's kind of like they want their tax. <laughs> They're like, hip, you heard it, hit a certain age. Now you need to take out a certain amount per year so that we get our cut, right? That's what the government wants to have happen. Um, the nice thing about it, it's protected. Bankruptcy, these are vehicles that are protected. Now with the Roth IRA, you do not get an upfront deduction. It also grows tax-free and it's tax-free when you take it out. So it's always, you know, with these two, it's always two out of three, right? Here we take a deduction now, here we don't, but it's tax-free later, right? So because it's tax-free later, the government doesn't care. They're like, okay, well, we're not, we're not getting anything later. So we don't care. You don't need to take a required minimum distribution, right? So it makes it very uh, nice also to have this as a tool to pass along to your heirs. It can be part of your um, estate planning strategy. It's also protected and you can start taking it out at 59 and a half years old. Comments on that, Jake, Mr. Financial those, Specialist. Th- th- those are a whole bunch of rules, but how do we get to a million? Yeah. How do we get to a million? So- Let's look at different age brackets. So we got somebody that's 20 years old. We've got different brackets here. 20 years old, 30 years old, 40, 50, right? Obviously, the younger you start, the less money you have to put in. If we want to get to a million dollars, it's quite possible for every age bracket. So let's kind of make some assumptions here. Let's assume with each of these, we're going to wait until age 67, I mean, we'll have a 12% ROI. Is that about kind of average, like 10, 12%? Is that that's something the market's been getting, right? Simon, I've got like a negative 12 right now. What's going on? No, anyway, I'll, I'll stop interrupting. Dollar let, cost let, averaging. Let, let, let's average just, over, over a period of decades, right? Yeah, yeah. I might be losing money, but I'm putting more in and it's like double down in Vegas. But anyway, for simplicity purposes, let's just talk about 12% average annualized rate of return, which is the S&P average, like it's literally the S&P average between 10 and 12%. Um, we don't really want to argue the point of what you're going to get. This is just a number and it's an assumption, exactly. right? Just, just an to assumption. show how this works. So when you're young, it's pretty awesome. <laughs> like everybody obviously wished they would have started when they were younger, 12 bucks for a cost of a takeout meal, uh, 12 bucks a week, you can get to a million dollars. Adam, how old are you, Adam? You look super young. I'm right in the middle of 30 and 40. I'm 35. 35. Very good. So now, when you're 30 and 40, obviously, the more you put in, the less you have to rely on the average rate of return. The more you put in, the higher rate of return, the more you end up with, right? So all these things kind of work together. So, you know, with the regular standard Roth or regular standard IRA, I call it IRA sometimes. Uh, I think most people will say IRA. I don't really know where I picked that up at. Um, with the standard IRA, who says we'll just IRA? call it your, your Euro- European influence, the IRA. Yeah. Who knows? Pick anyway. that up somewhere. IRA, you can put up to 6,500 a year. So you're already, you know, you're still under the max here for the regular standard IRAs, right? Now we're going to talk about some ways to um, pump up that contribution. So that way, when you're 40, 50 years old, you can put even more into, but that's how we get to that million dollars. 
Now, how do we get to the multi-million dollar Roth IRA? Well, um, like I said a few minutes ago, we either put more money in or we get a higher rate of return. So 10 to 12%, that's kind of the S&P standard and poor average of the stock market. So when we talk about higher rates of returns, we need to look at different types of investments, not just Wall Street. Now, obviously, you want to work with your financial advisor and say, okay, what's your risk tolerance for different types of investments? It's not a bad idea to be diversified, to have some money in Wall Street and have some money in real estate and so forth. Are, are you talking like Wall Street and Main Street? Yeah. Okay. So what does that mean, Main Street? So Main Street, I, buying, I a, using, using your IRA money to invest into a business. Or so I had a, client, I had a client the other day. Real estate. I was just going to share this real fast. I had a client that um, he owns a tech company. And uh, we were discussing a retirement plan for all the, the employees and for him and everything else. And had an interesting conversation. He says, yeah, I'm just doing this because it's a benefit because my employees want it. But really, I mean, why, why should I like max this out when I get the biggest bang or the biggest return on my investment from reinvesting in my own business? Right. And I said, well, okay, working with your, your chief financial officer, I mean, show, show me some of these returns. And he was showing me around a 4,000% rate of return investment on his app that he developed. Yeah. All right. So like literally, I'm not saying that everybody's a, a tech wizard, right? But whether it's real estate or whether it's their trade or business, it's their high side hustle. It's, it's something that they know and they understand that they're comfortable with. I mean, they ought to have kind yeah, of an aggressive into outlook, something, right? Invest into something you understand, invest into something you're passionate about. If you understand real estate, put that as part of your portfolio. If you mm -hmm. understand um, you know, a, another type of business, have that be part of your portfolio of, of your retirement account. Um, so, so maybe that's a maybe, lot maybe to be a Wall Street analyst and, and try to figure out the correct beta, alpha, whatever, rate of return, market fluctuations, um, you know. And so you look at, it's easily Googleable. You can look at, you know, what people have done like Peter Thiel or Mitt Romney. Mitt Romney had something like $25 million in his Roth IRA. Peter Thiel, one of the guys that um, helped start PayPal, has millions, even billions in their retirement accounts, all because they took that initial seed money and put it into buying stock of a business that they were a part of. Now, I think that there might be some ambiguity, right? We're talking about what other people have done and not all of them have done it the same way. Right. And we don't have time today to really go over how everyone can do this they themselves. This that's a little bit more of an individual discussion with everybody. Right, right. Um, but there are vehicles and there are methods and there are ways to legally legally do all of this and, and accomplish some of the same end goals that some of these other people that Simon just mentioned have accomplished. Yeah. Um, and we're more than willing and happy to dive deeper into some of this should people have questions after today's show and uh, should they want to know more. Yeah. So one of the ways to do this is through the self-directed IRAs. You know, one of the things Jake will tell you is that an IRA is just a vehicle. You can put inside of it whatever you want to. Um, these are all just vehicles. You can use it however you want to. You don't just have to open up a Schwab account, E-Trade account, and only invest into stocks. You can use a self-directed account. There's various companies that that provide self-directed accounts. And you can then take that money and invest it into a business, real estate, a side hustle, whatever you want to, right? So let's take an example of this. Like how can we take this money that's in your Roth IRA and how can we use that? So I'm going to use a real estate example. So let's say we have our Roth IRA and we have an LLC that you go up to the bank and you open it up, uh, a bank account where you are the manager, you have checkbook control, and you have a lot more options to invest this money. Now your LLC is the shell that's owned by the Roth. 
You've got that bank account. You can put that into a rental property. You can invest that into a business. You can invest that into crypto, gold, whatever alternative things that you're into, right? Meanwhile, the money that comes back from the business goes through the LLC bank account and belongs to the Roth. And all of that's growing tax-free. So all those, all that money coming back from the profits of the business, the cash flow coming back from the rental of the business, crypto, whatever it is, it's all coming back tax-free growth, right? And this is how I'm going to show you how we can create a lot higher returns on investment. And comments here, Jake. So not only can you just have your Roth IRA be part of the ownership of the LLC, you can combine all your other retirement accounts, your family's retirement accounts, your spouse's retirement account, your children's retirement account, whatever, they can all be part owners of this LLC. And so this is how you can pull the money together and buy into something like a rental property or a business or some other income generating side hustle. Yeah, I've got a question. Go are, there, yeah. are there are um, there requirements on on who owns the LLCs or or the businesses that the self-directed IRA is investing into? Like, can you own them? Can they just be yours? What's going to be your IRA, your IRA mm -hmm. that owns, that's the part owner of the LLC, right? And right. so when you work with a self-directed um, retirement account holding company, they are going to be able to help you with all those rules, right? That's something so, that beyond what I, what I do or get involved with. Now, now so this, this is, that business this is right a, there, the business at the top. Like yeah. let, let's say I'm a business owner and I I'm I don't know I'm a plumber I'm a plumber, yeah. right? And so can I have a Roth IRA that's invested into an LLC yeah. that is investing into my plumbing company? There might be some restrictions on that because it needs to be separate, right? There okay. needs to be some sort of arm's length separation. So it can't probably can't be your own business or your house, like you can't have that, right? You can't have it like have a property that you're benefiting from that you're living in, right? But gotcha. it's, it's something separate from you. You're buying into a brand new business or you're buying into a, a rental property. Yeah, and this is just a, an example of how getting the right advice from the right advisors to help you organize your, your laundry. Yeah. Or, or your, your financials, like what bank accounts go where, what entities go where, what instruments, what vehicles, is it an IRA, is it a 401k? How do I, you know, how much do I do in Wall Street? How much do I do in, in Main Street or in my own business or yeah. some, somebody else's business? Do I yeah. do it as a joint venture or do I do it all under one vehicle? Right. So those, those are questions that are specific to an individual scenario of which you need to have the right types of advisors around you, not to step on toes of anybody else. But if somebody doesn't have experience doing this, then keep asking until you find the people that do and that they can help you do it. Exactly. So with this real estate investment example, with your Roth IRA owning the LLC that then owns the rental property. So to kind of give you this, you know, very basic example of a return on investment. So let's say we have a $500,000 property and it has no loan. You're not leveraging it at all. You're just buying it flat out at $500,000, right? You may get some rents back from that, right? Let's say you get $3,000 a month, $36,000 a year. You've got some expenses. You've got maintenance. You've got you know, whatever management fees or whatever. At the end of the day, you're getting back $24,000 of cash flow. You're getting all the cash flow back because there's no payments on interest or principal. So if we talk about the cash on cash ROI, return on investment, we're talking about 24,000 divided by 500,000. That gives you about 4.8% cash on cash ROI. Now the property is also going up in value every year, right? Property's gone up in value a lot in the last year or two, right? Now, Let's say we take a 5% increase. We have a $25,000 appreciation on, on that 500K, right? Now, 
the appreciation ROI is now 5%, 5, 25,000 divided by 500K. So you add those two together, that gives you the 9.8% ROI. Not too bad. So that's right. just a normal example of like investing directly into a piece of real estate where you have all the money and it's all cash down and that's it right. appreciates it appreciates a little bit. I mean, this is a very conservative model. Like in Utah County, I think things were appreciating 5% a month. But anyway, I let's keep all these assumptions the same for the next next look that we're going to yeah, do. Yeah. Exactly. So, let's say we go get a loan on the property. We put down 30%, a conservative amount. Um, that way, if the property does come down in value, you're still safeguarded. You're not going to be overhead, you know, uh, underwater uh, on having a loan that's that's too big for for what you're doing. So we have a 70% loan to value. We still keep the same assumptions of the rents and the expenses, but now you're paying the principal and interest, obviously, right? So now your cash flow is going to be less. So after the note payment, you're going to have a cash flow of 1,400. So just looking at that, you're like, well, that doesn't seem that great. This cash flow is less than this cash flow. But let's talk about the return on investment. So the cash on cash return on investment is 0.97% because we're taking the 1,400 divided by the um, amount of money you, you put into it, 150K. But now, because of the leverage, your appreciation return on investment is a lot stronger. So now you're looking at the 25K increase. It's still the same dollar increase, but it's based upon the 150 you put in because you're able to take the 350 that you didn't have to spend and put it somewhere else. So now you've got a total return on investment of almost 18%. This is how you can buy real estate through your LLC, through your Roth IRA. And you're just going to have to look at different banks. You know, A lot of banks are probably going to have their head explode when they say, I want to buy real estate through my Roth. So you just have to find the right banker, find the right credit union, find a mortgage broker. I love mortgage brokers because they can shop a thousand different banks and they can find the right product for you, the right loan to value and the right um, type of stuff you need to show them, right? Types of tax returns. Hey, Simon, Jake, quick question for you. Um, with this strategy, um, it's all awesome. How does it work with the Roth IRA contribution limits? Yeah. So you can put in, obviously with the standard Roth, you're going to put in 6,500 a year, but there's ways to put in more. You can put in money through your 401k. Those limits are a lot higher, right? Just your self deferral amount is around 20,000. 20,500, I think, in 2022. You can convert that to a Roth 401k or a Roth IRA. Then there's the employer contribution amount. Let's say you have a business that's very profitable. Well, you, you can have your, um, your, your non elective uh, contribution be all the way up to $60,000 per year, $61,000 in 2022. Right? Yeah. So it, it really so just depends. Turbocharge. On I was just going to say, it depends on the client's situation, what they're able to do. Right. If they are a business owner, then they can do Roth contributions or they can do after-tax contributions from their business into a 401k. Um, some people may or may not have that option or availability. But essentially, for, for a small business owner, we are able to put up to 61000 or 67000 if they're over 50 um, of taxed income, right? So this is after-tax dollars into various different Roth vehicles over time that then all end up in something that they can invest in Wall Street or Main Street Roth. And it's, they call this mega backdoor Roth. They call it, you know, there's a lot of names for it, right? Essentially, it's just a strategy to be able to invest after tax dollars and have it grow tax-free and have it become so much more. And mm -hmm. not all of us are going to be Mitt Romney's with a $25 million Roth. But I think this could be a life-changing decision for a lot of different people, especially with current legislation right now where all tax rates everywhere just kind of, kind of seem to be pointing upwards. We need to diversify not only the cash flow that people have, but the tax flow. That's and right. so 
In diversifying the tax law, we can have a bucket of money that we can access tax-free, tax favored, tax deferred, whatever, right? So that people have control on how they're taxed rather than having it forced on them. Yeah. And what I think is so interesting is that so many of these things that you know we just hear about because we've always we've heard about it when we were employees and things rules change when you're a business owner. And most accountants will just say, yeah, you can put 6,500 into an IRA and that's it. That's kind of like the end of the story. Well, what about your SEP IRA? Well, you can put up to $60,000 in that, right? With the 401k, you can put a lot of money into that. So all these vehicles, these are where we can do the backdoor conversion into the Roth flavor of this vehicle, right? So you've got your vehicles, you've got your different flavors of vehicles, and then you can put different toppings inside of it, right? You can put different stuff into the vehicles. We just went from cars or vehicles to ice cream. I, I, like, I like the transition. Yeah. Um, but whether it's a different model of car, truck, semi. Ice cream cone, whatever. Yes, exactly. Yeah, exactly. So I think the, the thing that's interesting about this, when I started looking into this, was it just opens up a lot more options. And you want to look at what's in the client's situation. What do they want to do? And you want to, I want to be able to present these options to clients to say, yeah, there's more that you you can do than just your 401k deferral of of 20,500 or your, your IRA of 6,500, right? What else can you be doing with that money? And so again, because it's being held by that Roth vehicle, it's growing tax-free. So you sell this property that's owned by your LLC, that's owned by your Roth, um, all that gain, you don't even have to think about a 1031 exchange. You can just put it, sell it. You're going to have some closing costs, whatever. That's going to impact some of the ROI. But all that money goes into the Roth bank account tax-free, and you can put it back into something else. So that's the beauty of that. So this is how we can turbocharge these um, these returns on investment. And this this is how we get to this multi-million dollar Roth IRA concept. We have time for one more strategy here, Jake. Well, we have exactly one minute. Let's give a high level update and tell the folks to come back next Tuesday for a deeper dive into the mega backdoor Roth. We actually want to show you some charts and some graphs and how it actually works. I'm getting comments coming through on my cell phone. They should be posting them here in the group, but we'll, we'll do a deeper dive on that, but give a high level overview of how the HSA is uh, perhaps one of the uh, best secret little retirement accounts that people can have. Yeah. So I call it the, the secret retirement turbocharger. I like fast cars. So this is the uh, turbocharger, turbocharger on top of the V8 that you're already driving. So the HSA, the beauty of this is that if you have a business and a high high deductible insurance plan, you can take a deduction now, $3,600 for individuals or $7,300 for families. Um, You can do this with your, through an employer sometimes, depending on different healthcare plans they have, but you can have an HSA, you can take the deduction now, tax-free growth and- the triple, the trifecta here is the tax-free withdrawal for medical expenses. So if you have qualifying medical expenses, which are a lot of different things, um, chiropractic, prescriptions, anything like that, you don't have to take money out of the HSA right now. You can save those receipts 10, 20 years from now after your HSA has grown in, a, in an investment, in a Wall Street investment, in a Main Street investment. And then you can take money out of there tax-free. So the HSA is a tool. People know about it, but people don't often know about the other secret component of it, which is the tax-free growth in whatever investment you want to have. You can have a self-directed HSA and the component of being able to take money out tax-free, right? So we have the standard IRA, IRA, upfront deduction, you pay tax later. The Roth IRA, no deduction, but tax-free. The HSA gives you all three, right? So you're telling me I can deduct my money into an HSA. I can spend it tax-free on medical stuff. And at retirement, I can spend it? 
if I haven't spent it already? You're going to take, you're going to keep all your receipts until the time you do need the money and all the reimbursements are tax-free. Very good. Well, I think Simon, we need to tell the folks how they can reach us. Um, we're at the end of our hour and we need to touch yeah. on some of these things perhaps next week. But if they want to reach out in between now and then and they have questions for you, how do they get in touch? You can go to our website, kaufmanadvisors.com. What does Kaufman mean? So I'm half German. I was born in Berlin. My mom's German. She immigrated to the US. My dad was military, retired military. I was in the army myself. But Kaufman is the German word for business person. And since I advise business people, that's what I wanted to call it. So we have Simon Hayes, CPA, Kaufman Advisors. On their website, there's make an appointment. I see the link. And there's a phone number. Yeah. yeah. The appointment's the best. Don't call. Just, just go to the calendar. <laughs> You're busy. <laughs> schedule. Schedule. Yes. Uh, for me, if people want to go to strategictaxsolutions.com, it is, this is kind of like my, my educational um, side of things where I'm with Alfi Advisors. We have a series of professional service businesses. But strategictaxsolutions.com, this is where you can come and hear more. You can also reach out at the 800 number, 1-800-773-1848, or, or schedule an appointment as well. And we can help walk through and help people navigate how, these, how this advice might relate to their specific circumstances and what does or does not make sense for them. Great. Great. Well, next time, we'll try to do well, less. Thanks talk. for bringing me on as a guest. I appreciate it. <laughs> No, no, thank you for being here. And I was just saying, should, should, we, should we pay you enough money to come back, Simon? Um, hopefully, uh, we, we give a little more time to the, to the group so that they can ask specific questions. And we can also answer some of these questions that are coming in via text. So until yeah, next week, great. thank you, everyone. Awesome. Have a great weekend. Or week, Thanks. Weekend. Take care. Bye-bye. Thanks.